Well, hello, everybody. <laughs> Remember me? <laughs> you are on Anchored in Hope with Father Larry Richards. I'm Father Larry Richards, and I am not on here right now. It says I'm live, but nothing's coming out. Oh, here we go. This should be working. Good job. Anyway, so today is April the 4th already. Holy cow, can you imagine? April the 4th, 2024, and uh, we middle of Easter week, and that's a fantastic reality. So the first thing we got to do is pray. In the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Great God of love and mercy, help us to be fully alive in you. Help us to live every day focused on you, living the life you gave us, living, uh, hallelujah, from the top of our heads to the bottom of our feet, that we may truly be fully alive. We beg you these things, Holy Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Mary, Mother of Jesus, pray for us. Good Saint Joseph, pray for us. And Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, well, today being Easter week, again, again, so we remember, Lent is 40 days, Easter is 50 days. We are an Easter people. Resurrection is what we got to focus on. The, the, the feast of the resurrection is the highest feast day of the church. There's nothing greater. That's just period. That's the teaching of the church. The resurrection every Sunday is a celebration of the resurrection. And so Easter, the vigil mass, is the highest mass of the year. And the church has taught us this is such a fantastic and big um, day that one day can't contain it. So we celebrate it every day until next Sunday, uh, the Feast of Mercy. And so we are in the octave of Easter right now. So every day we say the Gloria or sing the Gloria. Um, and so as I talked about the last three days or four days, if you watch Daily Mass, is about living as a resurrected people. And again, um, you know, like Monday, I got very excited about how we need to be witnesses to the resurrection. <laughs> and people uh, make all their comments on the, the little reels that we put out. You know, uh, Mo takes what I, what I do at a homily, on certain homilies, and puts it into 59 seconds and then puts it out. And then people love to make all these comments. Or uh, since we only have 59 seconds, I can't teach the whole theology of uh, resurrection or anything in 59 seconds. So it's just uh, a focus on a particular point of that day. And so people will talk about, you know, whatever, like we, we need to be sad with people or we have to, there's all kinds of stuff that come out. And again, if they're, if they're, nice about it then we can let it stay but normally people are just nasty and again i just ban 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 only because people are not interested in uh questioning or having a real question or they could come here on live and ask me questions and i'll respond they just like to make comments and say how i'm wrong or i'm like a protestant or whatever the whole reality is but again we got to be focused on Jesus and not focused on just the negative comments and that that come in. But the point of saying all this is that when I talk about being a witness to the resurrection, someone talks about, no, we're not called to be that. We're just called to talk about the creed and doing all this stuff. And that's just not true. That Jesus Christ is alive and we enter into relationship with the living, loving God. It isn't just saying, I believe in Jesus that lived 2,000 years ago. If that's what this is, we are stupid, stupid, stupid people. Because Jesus is dead and we can't do anything. Paul says this, we do not follow a dead God. We follow a resurrected Lord that you and I not only can have a relationship with, but must have a relationship with. That's what we believe. Huh? And again, it's spiritual laziness for these people that sit there and say, no, I can't have a relationship with Jesus today. Of course you can. You better. Again, what's the teaching of the church? God, why did God make me? God made me too. Know him, to know him, to know him, to know him, to know him. Jesus is God. We're called to know him. Not know about him, but to know him. It's the 
teaching of the church. It's the meaning of life. It's why we were created. So again, do you know Jesus as the resurrected Lord? Not just about him, not just about his teaching, not just following his commandments, but being into intimacy with him. So if Jesus is alive and he wants to reveal himself to us. Now, he doesn't normally reveal himself to us the way he revealed himself to the apostles, but he does reveal himself to us, just as simple as every time you and I receive him in the Eucharist. It's not just a a symbol or a piece of bread or a vitamin pill. It's the living God. And so when you and I spend time, and again, the, the, the people that fight with me the most are the people that don't have a relationship with Jesus. They don't even try. They don't even think they can do it. You know, you want a relationship with Jesus, you spend an hour every week with Jesus in the most blessed sacrament, and you're going to grow in relationship with Jesus Christ. So, like, again, when I, when I deal with priests and I deal with a priest uh, retreats, I always tell the guys, guys, don't even talk to me unless you're doing a holy hour. Because you can know about Jesus, but not know Jesus. You have to do a holy hour. I believe, I believe with all my heart, a priest has to do a holy hour every day of their life. Every day, every day, every day, every day. After they're ordained a priest, they must do a holy hour. Why? So that they can know Jesus and they can point others to Jesus. They can be witnesses to Jesus. And so it's same with us. We must spend time with Jesus. And again, he might... In, pop out and show us him's reality physically as he did to Thomas, but he does physically uh, uh, present himself to us under the Eucharistic veil. And when we're with him, we get to spend time with him. But I want to go on about what does the resurrection mean, and I'm going to just focus on the catechism. Because now, again, um, those of you who aren't Catholic, you can fight with me about this. Uh, and that's okay, because that way we can uh, focus on a little bit more. But it uses a lot of scripture in the catechism. But those of you who are Catholic cannot argue with me about this, because this is the teaching of the church. This isn't Father Larry's interpretation. It's the teaching of the church. And the catechism, which talks about this, this is in the, the profession of faith part, right? And if you look at the catechism, again, the catechism is the official teaching of the church. So the first part, it just deals with the, uh, the creed, because this is what we believe, I believe. And so here, beginning at paragraph 988 of the Catechism of the Catholic Faith, it talks about, I believe in the resurrection of the body. So if you watched Mass this morning, I talked about this, that we believe in the resurrection of the body, because here's Jesus, and today he comes and appears to them physically, and he says, touch me, know that I am not a ghost, give me something to eat. Huh? And he asks for, they give him a piece of fish. And then I said today, famously, I said, listen, if that's all there is in heaven, it's fish forever. I'm not going. And he said, well, you're not going anyway, Father. Shut up. I have a choice. I have a choice and I also have a chance. Hopefully, there's just more to eat in heaven than, uh, than uh, fish. Hopefully, it'll be pizza there. But the reality is that people even sit there and think of that like, well, uh, uh, we're not going to eat in heaven, are we? I mean, I had a priest that said that to me once. We were arguing at dinner, not arguing, we were discussing. And he goes, we will not eat after the resurrection. I go, uh, the way Jesus rose, we shall rise. So as Jesus did, so shall we. Again, it doesn't mean, we, you know, again, the difference between the resurrection, and it's not really a resurrection, but the bringing back to life of Lazarus and the resurrection of Jesus is two entirely different things. When Lazarus, when Jesus brought Lazarus to life, he resuscitated a dead corpse. When Jesus rose to new life, the corpse was no longer there. It was transformed. So, like I said this morning, I says, God, anything he doesn't create, he doesn't destroy, he perfects it. Huh? That's the whole point. So, we get a resurrected body. But notice, when it looks to the scripture about how his body was different, he could pass through walls, he could be in one place and vanish and be in another place, and even though the doors were locked, he presented himself there, even though he could eat. So there's a lot of things going on. They didn't recognize Jesus at first, like at the road to Emmaus yesterday, if you went to daily mass, you know, or Mary didn't recognize him on Tuesday at the mass until Mary, Jesus said, Mary called her by name. 
And again, Jesus is calling us to intimacy, huh? to this intimacy. I could not be a priest. I sure as heck couldn't stay in priesthood unless I knew Jesus because it gets tiring. After, after Easter Sunday, I was exhausted. By God's grace, my parishioners, about 10 different people, um, invited me to their houses and I says I can't deal with anybody right now I gotta I gotta like shut down for a day or two or three or four or whatever just so I can um oh, recharge or I can let the Lord recharge me so Easter Sunday I had mass at 10 o'clock and went and got some uh dinner to bring back and went to bed early that day um slept in that morning and uh just vegged all day, just vegged. And then I was stressed because I had to do my taxes. And uh, I don't do my own taxes, of course, because I have a unique situation because I'm an employee, if you will, of the foundation, the reason for our hope, the building I'm in now. And then I'm kind of an employee of my parish, but they don't pay for Social Security. It's a weird thing in the diocese, how we do things here. And then I'm considered self-employed for my books and everything else. So I have a very complicated uh, tax returns. So it takes me two full days just taking the whole year and putting it. I'm not one of those ones, if I was to organize every day, I guess it'd be easy to turn in everything at the end of the year, but I'm not one of those. And so I was like stressed, like, okay, so all the next two days, that's all I'm going to do. So uh, I did two days of that, and I handed it in uh, t- Tuesday morning. And uh, so I'm still just trying to breathe. And, of course, I've told people to wait to, uh, after Easter, so everybody waited till the day after Easter and start. Well, Father, you said after Easter. Yes, I did, but I'm not ready yet. I'm just telling you now. I'm just, I need to uh, breathe. Anyway. So let's talk about what the, the catechism says when it comes to the resurrection. It says in first in verse, uh, so the, the Christian creed, the profession of our faith in God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and God's creative, saving, and sanctify action culminates, the ends, everything, in the proclamation of the resurrection of the dead on the last day in life everlasting. So we believe at the end of time, we'll get our bodies back. So The definition of death, of course, is when the spirit separates from the body. But then at the end of time, we'll have a resurrected body and our spirit will reunite with a resurrected body. But it'll be a perfected body from what we had. Even if you're cremated, no no matter what, if you're down to dust, whatever it is, your body will be resurrected in a transformed way, it'll come up from all the different places. And we will, again, a human being, by definition, is the union of body and soul. Jesus Christ is still a human being and God by the hypostatic union, 100% God and 100% man at the same time time. And so when we rise from the dead at the end of time, we will be united again with our bodies. Some will go to everlasting life and some will go to eternal damnation. Let's hope that we, (laughs) none of us go to eternal damnation, huh? Um, Again, so that, so we're going to have our bodies back in a resurrected, perfected form. And so this is what we proclaim after we say every creed. It's the end of it. It's what all things are building, that we're going to live forever. We're going to have a resurrection of the body. Not just the resurrection of Jesus' body, but the resurrection of our body. So it goes on that just as the Holy Spirit, our resurrection like his own will be the work of the most holy trinity. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies. Will give life to your mortal bodies. Not just to your soul, but to your mortal bodies. Also through his spirit who dwells within you. And you can, it says, see Romans 8, 11, 1 Thessalonians 4, 14, 1 Corinthians 6, 14, 2 Corinthians 4, 14, Philippians 3, 10 to 11. So it's all scriptural there. And then it continues on, belief in the resurrection of the dead has been an essential element of the Christian faith from the very beginning. The confidence of Christians in the resurrection of the dead, believing this, believing this, we live. 
So again, that we believe in the resurrection. And then it's been, it talks about in uh, chapter, I mean, paragraph 992 throughout the next thing. It talks about the resurrection has been revealed in stages throughout since the beginning. That's why in, in the Jewish religion, there was the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. That's why they're so sad, you see, exactly. And so here it goes to 995. To be a witness to Christ is to be a witness to his resurrection. So again, let's stop there. To be a witness to Christ is to be a witness to his resurrection. This is what I preached on on Monday, and it's out there on a reel. We need to be witnesses to the resurrection. It comes right from the catechism. It's not Father Larry making stuff up just to drive everybody insane. To have eaten and drunk with him after he rose from the dead, encounters with the risen Christ characterize the Christian hope of resurrection. We shall rise like Christ with him and through him. And then it says, how do the dead rise? In death, the separation of the soul from the body, the human body decays and soul goes to meet God while awaiting its reunion with its glorified body. God in his almighty power will definitively grant incorruptible life to our bodies by reuniting them with our souls through the power of Jesus' resurrection. That's paragraph 997. Who will rise? Paragraph 998. All the dead will rise. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So everyone is going to live forever with their bodies. And some will go to heaven and some will go to hell. How? 999. Christ is raised with his own body. See my hands and my feet that it's I myself. But he did not return to an earthly life. So in him, all of them will rise again with their bodies, which they now bear here. But Christ will change our lowly bodies to be like his own glorious body into a spiritual body. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? What kind of body do they come from? You foolish man, this is St. Paul. What, what sows does not come into life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body, which is to be like but a bare kernel. What is to sown is perishable, but it was raised as imperishable. The dead will be raised imperishable, for this perishable nature must be put on imperishably, and this mortal nature put on immortality. And that's 1 Corinthians 15, and it goes a bunch of stuff. So, again, uh, that's why one of the biggest... Um, uh, analogies of the resurrection is a, a butterfly, right? It goes in a cocoon and the caterpillar, if you will, dies. But it is transformed into a butterfly, a totally different life. It no longer crawls on the ground, but that same caterpillar that goes into the cocoon is the same butterfly that rises. You see, it's transformed, but the body is transformed, but it's still the same reality, huh? And so it shall be with us. How? This how exceeds our imagination and understanding. It's accessible only by faith. Yet our participation in the Eucharist already gives us a foretaste of the transfiguration of our bodies, huh? Oh, isn't that great? When you and I receive the Eucharist, we already get a foretaste of what it's going to be like to go to heaven, Right? And St. Irenaeus said this, just as Jesus that comes from, just as bread that comes from the earth after God's blessing has been invoked upon it, it is no longer ordinary bread, but Eucharist formed of two things, one, the earthly and the other, heavenly. So too our bodies, which partake of the Eucharist, are no longer corruptible, but possess the hope of resurrection. When? Definitely, definitively at the last day, at the end of the world. Indeed, the resurrection of the dead is closely associated with Christ uh, coming again. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with an angel's call, and the dead in Christ will rise first, risen with Christ. And it goes on and on. I just encourage you to... Um, to read this, these paragraphs here. Just go to the catechism. Because what I want to do now is just after I've established that, what does it mean to live as, as a resurrected person? Now, someone might say, now, Father, we are not resurrected yet. 
because we haven't died and haven't been reunited with our bodies. But the seed of resurrection is still in us. Again, just like the caterpillar become the butterfly, the seed is already there. So because Christ isn't dead, and again, where does Christ live? In heaven, Father. True. Where else does he live? Inside of you and me. Correct? So I have more than just the seed of resurrection inside of me. I have the living Lord, God of the universe that lives inside of you and me. Because, again, the theology of the church is when we were baptized, what happened? We died with Christ. And then we go into the water, and they used to submerge you to show you go into the tomb with Jesus. And then when you come out, now that you have died with Christ, I have been crucified with Christ, Galatians 2, 19 and 20. I have been crucified with Christ, so the life I live now is no longer my own. Christ lives inside of me. I still live my human life, yes, but it's a life of faith. The Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. So what does all this mean? We no longer live. If only we could get over that in our spirituality because we try to keep pushing ourselves, our opinions, our wants, our needs, our desires, our theology on to everybody else. We no longer live. Jesus Christ lives inside of us. So what does that mean? We got to die so Christ can live and we live in this resurrected reality. Uh, do you all understand what I'm trying to say? Don't, I'm, I'm excited just a little bit about all the reality. But we got to know this. Too often we forget. We get caught up into the world and the, and the world is suffering. Oh, my gosh. It's, there's so much suffering in the world. Every time I watch the news, you know, all the, the, the people are trying to help in Gaza and they get killed. Huh? The Holy Father says enough, 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 enough. And they're saying never enough. It's sad. There's sadness. And if we focus on just that, and we need to focus on it a little bit to have compassion on these people, to sit there and say we have to stop killing people. It's just enough, 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 enough. Huh? But at the same time, we cannot get taken down that rabbit hole that we think that's the end. We have to know that Christ uh, is alive within us and that all the garbage that's happening in the world now and just think about it we can you can go down there and the devil loves to bring that up to us so we can go down that rabbit hole and feel depressed and feel like what's the point da, da, da. or we can focus on jesus who has already conquered sin and death he's already conquered sin and death remember he said it's finished he's conquered it and so if we focus on jesus who lives within us the Jesus who's alive within us, then we will be these people of great hope. Huh? When I started this podcast, it was to, to try to give hope to people. Huh? And again, as I've, uh, we're going to be making a transition because when I try to get people that are hope-filled people, even in the Catholic Church, uh, people want to focus on all the garbage that's happening. And you can't be doing... Um, I was going to say you can't be doing both, but you have to be doing both in so many ways. But we we got to have hope in the midst of everything, no matter what. No matter how dark the darkness is. Remember, if you take a, um, a light and light the match and light a candle, it always conquers the darkness. That's one of the greatest things about the vigil mass, huh? the symbolism of the greatest mass. So... Um, it's always in darkness, and it has to be in nightfall. It must be dark outside when you start the vigil. And so in the midst of it, and it used to be um, when the vigil, you know, centuries ago was started, they have a big fire going, and people could see that fire from all over. And as they came to church for the vigil, they could see in the darkness this fire that was conquering all the night. And then they bless the fire and they light their resurrection candle and they hold up uh, and they say, uh, Christ our light. Christ our light. 
thanks be to God. And then Christ, our light, starts conquering the darkness, and then we start conquering with it, and we light our candles from the Christ light. We get part of that flame, so we're called to bring the light of Christ to pierce the darkness. So we don't get rid of the darkness, well, we do, but we... We do it by bringing the light, not by cursing it, not by just staying in darkness, but by transforming the darkness around us by the Christ of the light of Christ inside of us. Again, it's not me. Huh? If you went to daily mass today, the reading from uh, uh, the Acts of the Apostles after Peter and John healed the person, everybody's looking at him like, look what you did. He says, excuse me. Why are you looking at us as if it was from our own power, our own piety? Huh? And too often we look at even the saints and says, oh, look how holy they are because they could do this, they could do this, they could do that. But again, if you look at a saint in themselves by their own piety, it's opposite of what scripture says. It's the power of Christ within them. It's not Padre Pio who had the power. It's Jesus Christ in Padre Pio who had the power. And yet sometimes when we look at the saints, we get stuck on the saint and not Jesus inside the saint. And that's why we can make a distinction. Well, they were holy, I am not. They can do those things. Jesus said, um, the things I do, you will do greater. Why? Because I go to the Father. So, too often, we just do hero worship of our saints, and we put it on them and forget that that same Jesus, the same Spirit of the living God that lived in Padre Pio and all the saints is the same Jesus who's alive, resurrected, and lives inside of you and me. And if we know him and if we get out of the way and we let him, his light shine, his power take over our lives, then we'll start living resurrected life. Now, it won't be fully realized until we got our bodies back at the end of time, but we should be living resurrected life today. And again, the way that happens is we let Jesus live his life inside of us more and we conquer the darkness. We bring Christ to the world. Again, we don't bring ourselves to the world. We bring Jesus to the world. And so, when I am a witness to the resurrection, Jesus isn't just rose 2,000 years ago. Jesus rose and lives inside of you and me as followers. Huh? And so, my job is to bring people to the intimacy of Jesus inside of us too. When I was young, I used to, my other great spiritual director, Father James Peterson, and I used to say he was one of my proofs for the existence of God. Pete just showed God. He lived God. And you knew when you encountered Pete, we used to call him Pete, that Jesus was alive. Because he lived inside of Pete, Father Peterson, Monsignor Peterson. We need to be the same type people. And again, um, we're all going to do it in our different ways. Like I talked about on Holy Thursday, I talked about the humility of Jesus and how, you know, again, people want to sit there and pray the litany of humility, which is fine. But if you ever spend time in the litany of humility, it's a very prideful prayer because it's all focused on yourself, you know, that others may be loved and I may be forgotten. Again, you have one purpose. You have the purpose to do God's holy will, not to sit there and say, help me be forgotten. What if that's not God's will for you? Are you more concerned about being humble and making sure you pray that way or doing God's will, which makes you humble because you forget about yourself. Christianity is always the forgetfulness of self, never the focus on self, not in our spirituality. And I've talked about it a billion times. So what we got to do is let the world see Jesus inside of us, not focus on ourselves or look at my holiness or my piety. Look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. Look at Jesus who can live in a sinful person like me. Because again, as I talked about, I talked about Pope Francis. And again, he punched me in the stomach this Holy Thursday. When even in his wheelchair, he could have stayed home. But he went to a woman's prison. And they were on a platform. And in his wheelchair, he washed 12 women's feet. And then he kissed their feet. He didn't talk about humility. He lived humility. And then 
as I reflected on it, I said, I don't think I have the ability to kiss anybody's feet. It just, oh, everything inside of me. It's just, and again, that's when I focus on me. And that's the problem that I got to get out of the way and let Jesus. That's how you, that's how again and again and again, the devil can never imitate humility. That's why I know that Pope Francis is of God because the devil cannot imitate humility. The fake humility that's going around in the church is like, oh, I'm so humble, I'm so humble. Oh, it's not me. Shut up. Mary didn't do that. When she was called to be the mother of God, she didn't say, oh, no, not me. Go to Elizabeth. I'm not worthy. That ain't what she said. She didn't cut up in this pious, fake humility. She said, let it be done to me. Whatever God wants is what I want. That's true humility. Not the pious, oh, look at me, oh, don't look at me, oh, yes, oh, stop it, stop it, stop it. Humility is an action. It is not just a prayer. And so all this stuff, humility in our own life, is dying to myself and letting Jesus live inside of me. Letting the world see Jesus, not the world see me. Letting the world get to know Jesus more and me less. Again, he must increase, I must decrease. <sighs> if we do that, then we'll show the world Jesus. And the world doesn't need Father Larry Richards. The world doesn't need you. The world needs Jesus. And if we show the world Jesus, we can pierce the darkness, bring hope, and bring eternal life to others. Isn't that what you want? That's what God wants. Is that what we want? Let it truly be said that we are a resurrection people, that Jesus Christ lives his life inside of us. He's alive, so we're alive, and we will all live forever. Got it? Get it? Gonna live it? May each of you know his love today and forever. Amen. Okay, <laughs> let's sit there and go back here and start bringing some of the questions. I'm sorry, again, I haven't been here for a month because uh, I've been very busy, but I'm glad, so glad to be back with you people. Hello, everybody, Bruce and Harry and Violet and Susan. Okay, then, who is only eating fish tomorrow, you pagans? <laughs> um. Blessed Easter blaze, thank you. Bruce, good to see you. What are you doing for the eclipse, Father? Big doings in Erie. Yeah, I think everybody's nuts. But anyway, they're bringing all these people and they're saying, oh, it's a, everybody from work, they asked me to give off, give them time off. Okay, I gave them off and then my maintenance guy wants another half day off. You know, like really? Again, does anybody ever work? But the reality is, um, I don't get it because they're going to have all, might be 5 million people in Erie. Ooh, but, you know, so no one's going to be able to drive. I said, all you have to do is look up. No matter where you happen to be, just look up. You can see the eclipse if the sun. Because, again, you know, we are in Erie, Pennsylvania. And the sun doesn't come out that much in Erie, Pennsylvania. So it's going to be like a 50-50 shot right now, whether people in Erie are going to be able to see it or not see it. It just, it's going to be interesting. So anyway, the reality is I'm probably going to go out my house, work on my house, um, because I really, uh, gosh, I'm, it's been, I've been working on it for quite a while, but uh, I'm I need to do all kinds of stuff there. So it'll give me some time to be at my house to be working. So I'm excited. But I'll stop and look out. I got my lenses at, and I'll get out and see. So hopefully, uh, we'll see what's happening. Hello, Jared. Hello, Teresa. Hello, Father Larry. Question about today's homily. If a person dies and his family scattered the ashes on the ocean, will he, the deceased, be punished for that? No. Like I already talked about, uh, God can bring people out from everywhere. Joya. Hi, Joya. How's the pagan Paul? Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, Father Larry. I ran on a gentleman who said he is about to start seminary to study to be an exorcist. Is that how it works? I thought priests were selected for this, not that they chose to be this. Well, you can if you have an interest. So if he's a priest, there are some lay people that uh, can work with uh, the exorcist, but only a priest can really do an exorcism. They can help with exorcisms, but the power is really, again, uh, when it comes to exorcism, 
they do all this stuff. And, but my biggest thing, again, is that Christ lives inside of us. So that's all people, not just priests. So Christ is always stronger than the devil. And again, if we can get out of the way and show even the devil, Jesus Christ, and not us, because again, in Scripture, when they talked to, you know, remember those people that tried to do it in the name of Jesus, uh, and they said, Jesus, we know, or that one we know, but we, you, you, we don't know, and they beat the heck out of him. So the point is to know and to make sure we have faith that, uh, that Jesus is always more powerful than Satan by far. I mean, it's not even a, you know, it's, I mean, there's not even a question. There's not even a um, nothing. I mean, God is God, and God is bigger than the devil by far, by far, by far. So we have to just let him. But again, when lay people, they can help with that. Yes. Okay. Hello, Father Larry. How are you on this Thursday afternoon? I am tired, but I am blessed. Um, I just need to... Exactly, Doug. They have to have... Because they don't know him. We got to know Jesus. I'm not Catholic. I'm Presbyterian. Well, great, Sam. My father lived and died a Presbyterian. And I was brought to Christ by Billy Graham, a Baptist. So, again, it's all about Jesus, huh? It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Jared, hi, Father. I've listened to the podcast for years, first time live. Good job, Jared. I want to say I came into church six years ago after being a Protestant for 23 years. Good job. Well, I'm glad, Jared. It, uh, again, it's all Jesus. That's all. You can use anybody by far. And that's not a false humility. That's just the biggest truth ever. I can't tell you how many times, because, you know, I don't prepare homilies in that. Um, I just pray to the Holy Spirit and let him take over. And then after, I'm thinking, whoa, that was pretty good, Holy Spirit, because I didn't think of any of that. So it's always good. Welcome to the faith uh, for the last six years, uh, Sam. It's good to have you. Okay. Jill, hello, Father. What are your thoughts on forcing teens to attend religious ed after confirmation and our youth groups? I'm a big one that we don't force people into anything, but you can't force people into sacraments. Like right now, uh, in two weeks, we're going to have confirmation in my parish and with the cathedral. And so the kids have to all come in and tell me if they want to be confirmed or not. Now, I tell parents they should make their kids go to religious ed. But then the kids have to make a decision whether they want to be confirmed or not. Why? Because you can't force sacraments on people. You need faith. I mean, it's not magic. So, again, I think that, uh, to like, again, as long as kids are in your house, I would make them go to Mass on Sunday. Because the, at least they're going to hear something, you know. And people say, well, I don't want to force the faith. You're not forcing faith. You're forcing attendance. God can do stuff while they're there. You know, if they're not there, then it's harder for God to do stuff because, again, the world is focusing on especially young people 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We need to bring them into the light of Christ at least once a week so that the light of God can touch them. It's We leave them out into the world or out in the, they're dying flopping around in the sea of darkness. And if we don't bring him into the lifeboat at least once a week, we're not doing him a service. Once they're 18 and they no longer live in your house, they have to make their own decision. And you have to support that decision. God allows people to be separated from him forever in hell. He allows it because that's what they choose. And you have to do it. You have to do your best part. Now, again, when I talk about forcing people into mass... It's not just a, a nasty thing. You know, I've done that. Oh, my gosh, I used to. <laughs> anyway, but it's about we love them into the faith. So, again, when they look at you, they're saying one thing to you, mom or dad, sir or ma'am or mom or dad, I want to see Jesus. So if all you do is take them to church, it's not going to be enough. You have to show them Jesus every day, and you show them the love and the mercy of Jesus not the judgment of Jesus. You're forbidden to show them the judgment of Jesus. Jesus said he'll take care of that all by himself. So if we show them the love of God every day, and again, the statistics have been, if a mother goes to church, then like 10% of the kids will go to church. If a father goes to church, 90% of the kids will stay in church later in life. 
So it's a lot about teaching the fathers. I was just one of my kids who's now a priest uh, for a Byzantine order. He's married with six kids. Um, we're talking about how his, that they're, that the Byzantines of his right are more focused on instead of uh, children education, they're talking about parent, parental education so the parents can then teach the kids. But it's more, it's more of a formation, if you will, that we form them into being Jesus so that they can show the kids and teach the kids about Jesus. If we just teach them rules, they will stay away from the church. They just will. Nobody's, no one's attracted to God by rules. Huh? They're attracted by love. So we have to love them into the faith. Okay, But again, I still think we have to bring them into the church, but we have to go beyond all that. Okay. I feel that if you have to force anyone you've already failed or if you've not failed after encounter God again, so you have to keep bringing them in the encounter. What are you doing in Eclipse again? I talked about that. To clarify, should parents make their children attend religious after, after confirmation or youth group? Again, you can do that if it's a good experience, if they're leading people into Jesus. Again, now this is very, very controversial, but I talk about I wouldn't send my kids that just to any Catholic school because it calls themselves Catholic. The only way is if they're bringing the faith into their, uh, into their teachings. They're inviting people to know Jesus Christ. Uh, period. And again, if Catholic schools aren't doing that, they should close down, burn them all down. Not burn them down, that would be bad, but close them. Why do we spend all this money to keep kids if we're not showing them Jesus and not teaching them Jesus and not leading them into a resurrected encounter with the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ? I think that, again, sometimes we can do more damage than good unless we're leading. I, when I was to teaching at the prep school, I had a, I, uh, he's dead now, God rest him. But he would, was, didn't like me because he said I was trying to make cathedral prep, the Catholic boys high school, now it's co-ed, too Catholic. <sighs> really? When people, when you have a teacher like that, the teacher needs to be fired. There should be no teachers that any Catholic school that thinks that our job isn't to bring faith because the day we stop bringing faith to kids is the day we should close period, comma, end of all paragraphs. I don't care what anybody else says. Again, I'm very opinionated, don't you know? So again, though, if they're, if in, in those realities, are they bringing them into intimacy with Jesus? Because just going to a youth group or whatever, and if they're not teaching the true faith, then what's the point of making them do that? They'll resent you for that. Okay. So I can't tell you yes or no, because I don't know what's going on in your area. Okay. Afternoon, oh, hi, Margaret. Have a spring snowstorm. We had a warmer uh, uh, winter than we did spring here. When I was in confession, the priest was running late for something else, and he said, I absolve you of your sins, but the prayer that is usually said beforehand was not said. Is it still valid? Well, the, Holy, the church is very much, and we have to say the words of the church to be valid. Um, have a blessed Easter season. Missed you. Thanks. Uh, fire into many flames, vibe, and never dim exactly. Angela, hello, Father Larry. I'm curious. At what point of time were plenary indulgences created? How do you know that God and Jesus agree with the condition requirements the church has set up? Well, they, were con uh, they weren't there from the beginning, that's for sure. They were brought up, and again, uh, Jesus is alive in his church, so uh, that's part of what the church does as it continues. See, again, <laughs> Uh, the ones we like, we agree with and say, this came from Jesus. The things that we don't agree with, we say, no, that's not of God, <laughs> like they do with Francis now. You know, but the development of doctrine has been developing a long time. Um, even the very thing about the Trinity, I mean, again, if you ever sit there, they baptize people not in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit in the beginning, but in the name of Jesus. And then later on, when, you know, uh, Jesus explicitly said, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So we have a development of doctrine. So, the, Jesus uh, established a church according to the catechism. Again, it's just appropriate that I would have the catechism here today. I always have them up there. But if you ever go, I love the opening line of the catechism, and this was written by John Paul II, uh, the great, right? So, the opening of the catechism says this, guarding, and it's in big, all capital letters, Guarding the deposit of the faith is the mission 
which the Lord entrusted to his church. So, the whole catechism, according to John Paul, who wrote that or had it written, the whole mission of the church is to guard that which Jesus taught us, guard the deposit of the faith. So, we get insights into that, how we've heard confessions throughout, and we've spent time on that here. Again, if you're just watching, so how, I don't have time to go into the history of that. I've done that in other places. So, whenever you listen to anything I say, you got to remember it's only a little bit of time. There's other places I've went into deeper. And again, I don't have an unpublished thought, people. I don't know if you know that. There's so much online. Or go Again, hopefully everybody here has our app, our Hope TV. Hopefully, if you don't get it, don't you leave today without downloading the app, our Hope TV. Everything I've ever taught, everything and all these other things are all in the app. It's 100% free. It costs us $30,000 a year, but it's 100% free to you. So I would hate to spend all that money if it's not being used. So go to our Hope TV and you can talk talks about indulgences and all that kind of stuff. You'll find all that on there. You just put in there uh, purgatory indulgences, like all that stuff was developed doctrine. And um, so, um, but again, Jesus is guarding us and gave us the Holy Spirit to not lead people astray. That's the easiest way for me to say that. Okay. Uh, I'm a Catholic at 71. Good job, Robbie. Welcome uh, to the faith. That's great. God bless you. Blessed and joyful Easter. Thank you, Tony. I feel like my heart would burst out of my chest. Bless you, Father, and thank you for your encouragement. There you go. Great job, Robbie. Welcome. Um, it's just the beginning. Even if you're 71, it's just the beginning. Very good. God bless you, Father Richards. Thank you. I always go by Father Larry. You can always tell people when they don't know me, they'll call me Father Richards. That's for old people. I'm not old yet, so I always go by Father Larry. But thank you very much. Are priests required to say daily Mass? They're not required, but they're encouraged. Uh, John Paul II talked about it. And again, for me, um, to say daily Mass is the most important thing. It's give us this day our daily bread. Now, again, I know priests that don't. But when I do priest retreats, I always encourage them. You should go to ha ha say daily Mass, of course. Okay. Do-do-do-do-do-do-do. Jan Campbell. Thank you, Father, the living Christ. It's hard to me explain as I know what you are explaining. Now I can help those who want to come into full faith into the Catholic faith. Good job. Thank you, Father. Margaret, uh, also Monday 4-8 is the Annunciation. It is the Annunciation. They had a transfer. Usually it's the 25th of March, which is exactly nine months from December 25th. I don't even talk about Christmas now. It drives me crazy. But anyway, so yes, uh, it's transferred to this Monday on the feast. The Annunciation is when there will be the, you know, covering of the sun. Uh, hi, Father Larry. Hi, Steve, you pagan. Uh, all are welcome to the Catholic Church. You got that. Uh, Alberta, I want to say thank you for coming to Orlando in February. It was great being in Orlando in February. You talked to me and I'm pressing a sternness toward the faithful. I hope I'm not that stern. Um, often, like I was talking to my priest friend today, and we were talking about how I, every time I preach, I sound angry. Oh, you know. And again, my, my, I'm not normally sometimes i am um but I, again i want people to remember like when i do a mission as i told you when i was down there uh every night people are going to get mad at me and i says and that's part of my job is to get them mad at me if you will they got mad at jesus and then i said so when you're praying and you go to bed at night and you're praying for my death hopefully not but people do that you have to at least think about what i said so when I'm jumping up and down, when I'm doing all this, because again, as I was talking today at Our Lady of Fatima, when Our Lady of Fatima says people go to hell like snowflakes in a snowstorm. Now again, John Paul, um, who had great devotion to Our Lady of Fatima, said in his Crossing a Threshold of Hope, which I preached on last week, um, that we know hell exists, but we don't know if anybody's there. And I've always thought, how can he say that after the thing of Fatima? And then he says, we don't even know if Judas is in hell. Oh, can you imagine? This isn't Pope Francis, it's John Paul II. But I always feel that I got to preach strong so that 
no one will go to hell because of me. Meaning that I want to impress in them stuff that they'll remember that they die. And the purpose and the meaning and the importance of being in a relationship with Jesus and do what he asks of us out of love, not out of fear, so that they can live forever. So that's why I'm strong, and that's why I jump up and down. You know, some people say, uh, Dr. Ray Garendi, you know, he's only about three foot about this big. You know, I'm with on EWTN every week. And the way he comes when he makes fun of me is he'll go out into the uh, congregation if he's preaching or for the same thing. And he says, I'm Father Larry Richards, and he'll start screaming and jumping up and down. You can't really see him because he's so small. But anyway, but that's how he makes fun of me is me jumping up and down. So it's kind of just like... Uh, uh, I want to get people's attention so they can live forever. So that's why I get that. But thank you for that. Um, wonderful app. Hey, Susan. Eileen, any chance you're visiting the Patterson Diocese? I will be in uh, New Jersey. I don't know if it's Patterson. I'm going to be in New Jersey at the end of uh, May. Um, I am going to be right the week before Memorial Day, so the 20th. To the 23rd, I will be in Melissa Hill, New Jersey. Melissa, M-U-L-L-I-C-A, M-U-L-L, the Catholic Community of the Holy Spirit. And that'll be every night. Uh, it doesn't say on here. It's supposed to say what the time and everything is, but none of that stuff's in there yet. Anyway, so uh, I will be down there. We'll be starting that uh, that day. So, it wouldn't be too far. I'm, pr I'm only 30 minutes from Philadelphia, so I don't know if that's going to be close to you, but I'll be down in the area anyway. Uh, we do a parish mission more than once at a church. I did in Holy Family. That was My last one was 11 years, though, so it's, um, um, it was been 11 years. So usually not, but I have. Um, Father Adoration will be back on Thursday, May 2nd. I'm flying in the afternoon we don't have adoration. Yeah, Thursday we will, yes. We're, we're not having it um, for the eclipse because people didn't want to get there and try to get there in traffic and everything. So, again, people can still come into the adoration chapel. It'll be open. We just won't have adoration. So if people can't come there. I know you're not Father Larry, but it was refreshing to hear it. I went to confession to you, and you gave me an earful for confessing and being guilty for things I confessed previously. Sorry, I can be that way. <laughs> and me being a faithful, thinking I needed to confess it, but I didn't. I was thinking straight and narrow and, of course, a humble. But you know I go once a month to make sure I don't live in sin. Very good. And again, I can be hard in confession. Uh, never with the great sinners, but the ones, again, the whole thing is be focused on Jesus and forget about the past. Get rid of it, confess it, and never think about it again. Okay, let's go here to some of the things that came in. Father, sometimes when I'm facing a crisis, like now, I don't pray as much because I feel God has made his decision. I feel times it doesn't matter. Well, Gina, all the more you need to sit there and uh, be held by Jesus during that. To try to do it yourself is, makes it much harder. But if you embrace the cross, if Christ gives you the cross, or God the Father gives you the cross, like when Jesus said, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do this, and God the Father kept pointing to the cross, he said, but your will be done. And when he embraced the cross, then he brought salvation to the world. So always embrace God at that time. Don't run from him. Again, you're not trying to tell God what to do. You're trying to let him hold you. Like, again, I've used the example, if, uh, if you're a mother and your kid has a, a, you know, pneumonia or something and they're dying and you're taking them to the emergency room and they look at you and say, Mommy, I trust you. Don't you ever let that doctor give me a needle. And you're saying, okay, I'll try, but I, whatever's going to be best for you. And say, Mommy, I trust you. I trust you. And you go to the emergency room and the doctor says he needs a shot or he's going to die. And you hold your child as the doctor gives them a shot. And they look at you and say, I trusted you. I trusted you that you wouldn't let that doctor hurt me. And yet you held him as the doctor gave the pain. Sometimes God is holding us when we're getting our shots. But you got to let him hold you. Don't do it alone. And know that everything that happens is for our good. You can't see the future. God is already at the future, so trust him, okay? 
Hello, Father Larry. I love listening to your thing. I'm a young man and a high school student who just last year met Jesus and who he is. See, very good. Now I'm trying to figure out how to live a life more with Jesus. Any advice to keep Jesus at the center of my life and how to embrace Jesus more and accept his love? Again, prayer is the most important. And with that prayer is spending time with the scriptures. Again, as I told my people again this past Lent, and I'd encourage you to do, um, go through the Gospels and write down the characteristics of Jesus. Start a journal, getting to know Jesus, call it. And start with Matthew, go, it'll, it'll take you f- less than 40 days, do two chapters a day, and write down all the characteristics of Jesus. If it's too much for you, do a chapter a day. And it'll take you about 80 days then, but still. And you go through it every day and you look at the care. What did Jesus say? What did Jesus do? And then after you do that, Jesus, make me more like you. Say that. Jesus, make me more like you. And he will. I have a question. You have taught me through your podcast to not waste any moment of suffering and that we should offer the suffering for others. I now do that regularly, but I am not sure if I'm doing it right. For example, when I fast, I want to offer a specific person, such as my mom. Do I say, God, I offer you my fast today to benefit my mother, or should I say, God, I offer my fast today to my mother? I do not want to disrespect God. Again, just tell God from your heart, Lord, I offer this today for my mother. That's all. God, you know, he doesn't go crazy with all the the things about it just from your heart he loves when you just talk to him and you just say lord i do this today because of my mom let all the suffering if i any discomfort i feel today be for her good okay okay dear father larry last night i watched an episode of living right with dr ray and you were the guest for a segment i'm on every week with dr ray thank you very much father i can't stop thinking about it you said if we miss church and don't help the poor we're going to hell (laughs) objectively yes but again, that's not the thing. You know, uh, missing church objectively is a mortal sin, not by my teaching. And Jesus said, unless you give to the poor, you know, get out of my sight, you condemn. Please know I love you as a priest. I really like to listen to you. I have gone to Mass most of my life. The last four months I have not attended. I made the decision not because of how liberal all the churches here are. But you've cut yourself off from the body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus Christ. That's why it's such a thing. I feel like it's the devil up there talking i do go to adoration but there but that's as close as it gets you're in charge of your spiritual life that's not a good place to be should i go even though i do not agree with the priests yes you must go to mass because jesus says unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood you have no life within you my alms were always given at church you don't have to do that I am confused and don't know what to do. I would sincerely consider any advice you have to offer. Please know post-COVID, I left my home church and tried all the Catholic churches around me. I just feel the message is not what it should be anymore. Again, then you're in charge. You have to humble yourself. There's no salvation without humility. Even the man on the cross next to Jesus He had to humble himself to say, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. It's not just you and Jesus. It's you and the whole body. To separate yourself from the body is to separate yourself from Jesus. So get back to church. Um, So hopefully that helps. Okay, I got to get out of here. I get to see my shrink. I haven't seen my shrink in the last uh, (laughs) two months. And uh, oh, I need it to talk about things so anyway please if you would pray for me i need to um i need to recharge so i can keep doing what i need to be doing i'm already starting to feel the recharging come along but i just need to uh, uh slowly i haven't even got through and thank all those all of you who sent birthday cards and easter cards i haven't even opened them all yet i still have this pile this big on my desk Uh, So, but I do thank you for taking time to wish me a happy 64th birthday. But uh, when it happens during Holy Week, it was last Tuesday, which was like, oh, I didn't have time. So my my office is a mess. And until I get all that stuff situated, I'm always kind of like, I said to the Lord, I stopped in the chapel today many times it's up next to my room and i just said jesus you got to get rid of this chaos in my life all around me because when there's chaos outside of me there's chaos inside of me even though jesus lives inside of me i can sometimes focus on the chaos and not jesus 
You think I'm in the same boat as all of you people? We're all in this together. To refocus Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That's what I'm trying to do now. And so I'd encourage, I'd uh, appreciate very much your prayers for that. Know that I'm praying for you twice a day, every day. I just don't uh, say that I do that, that I love you. I pray for you. Please pray for me. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless, keep, and protect you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, Holy Spirit, amen. God willing, we'll see you next Thursday. God bless you.